We approach the throne of mercy with the reverence this morning, coming to be taught of you, directed of you, and even guided of you. As we commemorate and remember this day, when you give it all up for us, for our sins, and for our redemption, may we also purpose to die in sin as you died, so that we can be able to resurrect with you. As I share your word this morning, may it be ordained of you, and may you, Father, seize my heart and my tongue to speak that which comes from you. I commit all that are here into thy hands. Give us the spirit of discernment and patience to hear and hearken unto your word. This is my prayer of faith, believing and trust in Jesus' name. Amen. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. We thank God for this opportunity that he has given us to come to his sanctuary to reenact, to remember, and reminisce the life he gave up for my sins and also for your sins. We are reminded that very many years ago, one who had no sin looked at mankind and his heart was dampened because his purpose and desire for us was not to live as fallen people, but to live as people who walk in the space God intended us to walk into. And because of our fallen nature, because of the sin that had crept unto us, because of the situation God saw humanity and mankind in, he sent his son and his only beloved son to come for my sins and also for your sins so that we could be given another lease of life and another chance in the lives that we live. And so today is one of those days that we take great introspection into our lives to understand and to fathom whether we are walking in the way that God intended us to walk in. We have read seven lessons, and for those of you who are keen, you would appreciate the seven lessons mirror the seven words of Christ on the cross. And so I know some of you might say, how come the Anglicans don't go to the way of the cross? like our brothers and sisters in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church and faith do. But we've already walked the seven stages and the seven steps, understanding, appreciating the things that Christ went through. And I would want us to reflect on the last words of Jesus on the cross. And as also come to look and reflect on also the sermonette for this morning. And the first word, as we heard, is he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He said that because they were crucifying the very person who was coming to save them. They were crucifying the very person who was coming to bring them good news. They were crucifying the very person who was coming to bring them great light in their lives. And that's why when he understood and appreciated that their ignorance is what was leading them to crucify him, he said and urged the Father to forgive them. Fast forward 2,000 years later, God is calling us to be gracious enough to be able to forgive others. God is reminding us that we need not live our lives on a pedestal of ignorance, not understanding that in the world we live in, there will be people who wrong us, there will be people who do things to us, there will be people who talk about us, there will be even people who literally crucify us in our lives. But God is telling us we need 
to learn forgiveness because that is what he did to those who crucified him, although he had actually come to bring salvation. May God help us this morning to be able to forgive others, to be able to know we don't need to take the high road of the pedestal of righteousness and try to be like the Pharisees or the Sadducees who believed they were perfect and beyond redemption. May God help and beyond reproach. May God help us to know that we sin, we fall short of his glory, and the only reason we are able to come and unite in this common corporate prayer is because of the masses of God in our life. In our lives. And so, may we purpose, just like Christ was able to forgive others and to forgive his tormentors, may we also be able to forgive those who become tormentors in our lives. They could be family, they could be relations, they could be fellow Christians, they could be fellow church members, but God is telling us, whatever they put you through, just like he was gracious enough to forgive those who tormented him, may we also be gracious enough to forgive others in our lives. The second lesson that we draw from his word on the cross is where he said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise, or today you shall be with me in paradise. And this is just a reminder that heaven is real. If anyone of us here, and I pray there's none here, who thinks that what we do every Sunday is a complete sheer waste of time, then I would want to be on the side of more than a billion people who believe in that foolishness. Heaven is real. If you have any figment of doubt, it is important to understand it is not somebody who said it. It is God himself who said, today you shall be with me in, pa in paradise. And he would not have told his fellow or the thief that they were crucified with that today you shall be with me in paradise if he never believed in, he in heaven. And so, as we come to church every Sunday, as we purpose to be close to God, as we purpose to walk in his ways, as we confess our sins, may we be reminded that we have somewhere we are going. We have a destination. And our destination is not in this world. Our destination is in, he in heaven. The desire, the purpose, and the motivation should not be to be perfect here. It should be to be perfect in purposing to live in our heavenly abode. abode. Because it is not me promising you where you are going. It is not the bishop promising you where you are going. It is Jesus himself who promised because he said, today you shall be with me in, para in paradise. And so, our focus and attention should always be to purpose and to desire to offload and shed anything that would make us not be able to be with Jesus and to be with him in paradise. The third lesson that we can learn from his word on the cross is the third word he said. And he said, Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. In essence, Jesus was trying to say, as we pursue heavenly aspirations, as we pursue and desire to be with him in the heavenly abode, it is important to be reminded, as Christians today, that we live in this world. And so, it is important to take care of our relations and our parents. It is important to recognize those who brought you into this world. Today, as a solemn service, maybe it is time for you to say, I think I haven't seen and visited mom in a long time. I think I haven't visited my brothers in a long time. I think I haven't seen my relations in a while. It is time for you to ask yourself, what are you doing to be able 
to enhance God's kingdom right here on earth. And that's why Christ himself, before he died, he said, Woman, behold thy son, behold my mother. He was emphasizing and re-emphasizing the things of this world in terms of our social relationships. May God help us that as we pursue our heavenly agenda, we try to make a little heaven here on earth for the people God has put in our life, in our lives. May we desire to make them see the radiation of Christ in our lives by the way we live. May we not be surprising them when we greet hands with others and you say, Mwadhan Yagosho, and they look back and wonder, are you really real in what you are saying? Because they have never seen Christ in you. They have never felt Christ in you. They have never sensed Christ in you. May God help us to be reminded to take care of our parents and our immediate relations. That's why in that third word, he was able to say, Behold thy son, behold thy mother. May we, as we reflect on this day of Good Friday, ask ourselves, are we doing things that when those immediately next to us look at us, they can actually be able to see the goodness of the Lord in our lives. The third lesson is the fourth word he said, the fourth lesson and the fourth word is what he said on the cross. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or why have you forsaken me? And this is a reminder that when we are in challenges, when we are in situations, when we are going through dark tunnels and deep valleys, it is important to express our hearts to God. He was in a tight spot. He was at a corner. He was feeling dejected. He was feeling it is nearing his end. And he cried out to the Father and he said, why do you forsake me? Do we recall, do we remember to call upon God when we are in trouble? Do we recall and remember to shout to him when we face situations? Many, when they have challenges, they run to their parents. Many, when they have challenges, they run to their friends. Many, when they run, have challenges, they come to the altar people, which is okay. But the first point of reference so it should be your father in, he in heaven. Talk to him, remind him, urge him, and make it known to him. Jesus did not call out to the people tormenting him. Jesus did not call to the Roman soldiers who were crucifying him. Jesus did not call out to the women who were watching from afar when he was on the cross. Jesus called out to his Father in, he in heaven. He knew there were women watching from afar. He knew there were Roman soldiers around, but he never reached out to them. He only reached out to the Father in, he in heaven. When you have challenges, when you go through situations, who do you reach out to? Don't reach out to the evangelist first. Don't reach out to me first. Don't reach out to the leaders first. Reach out to their Father in heaven so that even by the time you come to me, by the time you come to the evangelist, God has already created a pathway. God has already spoken his word. God has already done something new in relation to the challenge you are going through. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth word we learn is, he said, I thirst, or I am thirsty. And this morning, as we go through the events of this day, may we be thirsty for the living water. And the living water is not what you get in my dispenser in the office. The living water is not what you buy in a bottle called labeled Keringet. 
The living water is not what you get from your tap. The living water is our Father in, he in heaven. May you desire to know him. May you desire to walk with him. May you desire to invite him into your life. Thirst for him. Christ thirsted for God. And that's why he said, I, th I thirst. He was not saying. And that's why the people near thought he was thirsting for water. And that's why they gave him wine and vinegar. But that's not what he was thirsting for. He was thirsting for his father in, he in heaven. Even when we are in situations, when we go through challenges, when we feel that we are in a tight corner, may we thirst for God. Even when people talk ill about us, even when people persecute us, even when people put us down, God is reminding us we need to only thirst for, for him. There is no one else we should thirst for. Husbands should not thirst for their, their wives. Wives should not just thirst for their husbands. It's good to have a relationship. Father, parents should not just thirst for their children, but they should thirst for their father in, he in heaven. So that when you thirst for him, he will come and sort out the situations and the challenges you might be facing in your life. And so, as the fifth word reminds us, I thirst, may we thirst for the right things in this society. May we thirst for righteousness. May we thirst for justice. May we thirst for equity. May we thirst for the ability to walk and help humanity. The sixth word which is said on the cross is, it is finished. And I like the elaboration that was given. When he said it is finished, he did not mean he's finished. He means it is finished that which I had been sent to, fu to fulfill. If he had said he's finished, it means he would have been defeated on the cross and there would be no salvation for us. But he said it is finished because he had been able to meet his end of the bargain with his father in, he in heaven. And this morning, I'm here to remind you, the one who called you will be able to help you finish it. And so, don't give up, finish it. I know you go through challenges. I know you go through situations. I know you go through temptations. I know sometimes, for those who have confessed their sins, you look back and maybe you think the life you lived before you came to the Lord's vineyard was better. But I'm reminding you, don't give up. Finish it. Because he who called you is mightier and stronger than he who you served before you came to his vineyard. And so, just like he said it is finished, I remind you, don't give up. This is not the time to give up. If he had given up 2,000 years later, we would be pagans because there would be no Christianity and no salvation. But because he didn't give up, we can be able to look at tomorrow with confidence because he finished what his father had sent him to do. And that was to redeem my life and to redeem also your life. The seventh word he said on the cross was, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And this morning, I am here to remind you that it is important to place your life in God's hands. I don't know in whose hands you have placed them. There are some who have placed their lives in their friends' hands. Some have placed their lives in their doctor's hands. Some have placed their lives in their spouse's life hands. Some have placed their lives in their altar servants' lives. But that's not what God is calling us to do. God is calling us to be able to place our lives in his, ha in his hands. It is him who can be able to stand with you. It is him who can be able to direct you. It is him who can be able to guide you. It is him who can be able to give you his complete healing and, salve and salvation. And so, may we stop placing our lives in the wrong hands. Some might have placed their lives in 
the aspect of witch doctors. And it is unfortunate that you could be trying two religions at the same time. Because witchcraft is a religion on its own, isn't it? And so, may we be able to place our lives in the right hands. And the only right hands are the hands of God. Of God. And that's why when Jesus gave up his life and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He was saying, I know I cannot make it on my, on my own. But if I trust in you, if I believe in you, and if I commend my spirit in your hands, I know, Father, you will be able to do great things for me. And that's why, by commending his spirit in the hands of God, on the third day, God was able to resurrect him from the, from the tomb. And so, even for you, the things you are going through, and you feel like you have reached the end of the stick, the end of the road, this is the time to commend your life into thy hands of God. And for sure, God is going to make the things that are dying become alive again. again. He's going to renew them. He's going to turn them around. If it's your business that has been going in the wrong direction, God is saying, commend it in my hands. If it is your marriage that has been going in the wrong direction, God is saying, commend it in my hands. If it is your family that has been going in the wrong direction, God is saying, commend it in my, in my hands. And so, as we reflect on this day, maybe we will be reminded that those seven words he said on the cross are the epitome of our salvation. They are the epitome of our life, and they define where we move from here. And as he is crucified with the three, the two thieves, may we purpose to be crucified with him so that we can resurrect with, with him. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.